Hi there. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. I can't really think of much I'd rather do than talk about human evolution with some smart people, maybe a few adult libations thrown in there. Um, so how many of you, just show of hands, how many of you are interested in, in coming to a talk about human evolution? Raise your hand. Okay, just about everybody. That's great. Now, how many of you are interested in coming tonight because there was a talk with the word sex in the title? Not, not bad, okay, several of you. Um, thank you for your honesty. The rest of you are liars. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, so, you know, Darwin was actually born uh, two days before Valentine's Day and we're two days after Valentine's Day. Something you might not, have know, might not know about Charles Darwin is that he was a bit of a romantic. Um, and, and this is real. This is a, a, a list of pros and cons that he made for himself about whether he should get married or not, okay? And I've just taken some, some choice ones that I, that I like here. So not, to, you know, should he not get married or should he marry? So advantage, so um, not, on the side of not marrying, um, freedom to go where one liked. Conversation of clever men at clubs. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know why you can't do that if you're married, but maybe less of it. No expense and anxiety of children. <laughs> Preach it, Charles, um, for sure there's. Um, not forced to visit relatives and bend every trifle. Every trifle. On the other hand, on the plus side, children. I mean, they're, you know, little parasites, but God love them. You know, they're <laughs> um, constant companion and friend in old age. That's nice. Charms of music and female chit-chat. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you can't listen to music um, unless you're married. I guess there's more female chit-chat if you're heterosexually married or married to one. Um, how about, I like this one though. Picture to yourself, nice, soft wife on a sofa with a good fire and books and music. That sounds nice, right? Um, sure, nice, soft wife. And then how about this one? Object to be beloved and played with. Wait, what? <laughs> now, I don't know how romantic, that's, and then, and then, and I'm not kidding about this, better than dog anyhow. He ro okay, so Darwin the Romantic, maybe, maybe sort of Victorian era pragmatist is maybe a little bit better. Something else you might not know about Darwin is that um, the thought of a peacock's tail feathers made him sick to his stomach. Yeah, he said that. And he, to understand why that was, you have to think about how he was thinking about how, how natural selection shaped organisms. Because he was thinking about um, organisms being selected to survive in their, what, what he called the, their conditions of life, right? To have, have traits that enabled them to survive where they lived. And so when he thought about a peacock's tail feathers, he thought, look, this is a trait that is uh, expensive to produce and maintain. It makes them more obvious to predators, harder to get away from predators. I'm getting queasy just thinking about it. And um, so he proposed another kind of selection in later editions of Origin of Species. And then, um, and then he wrote a whole book about it in 1871 about sexual selection. And so Darwin said, you know, there's another kind of natural selection that favors traits that win mating opportunities. And in, in a way, if a trait was helpful enough in winning mates, it could compensate for some detriment to survival. And so he called that sexual selection. And there are multiple so-called mechanisms or modes of sexual selection, means of competing for mates. And I'm going to talk about two of them because um, in most of this talk, I'm going to use the voice as sort of a window into human sexual selection. And the two types of sexual selection, the two mechanisms that are most relevant to, uh, to, to voice in humans are contest competition and mate choice. So contest competition is the use of force or threat of force to exclude same-sex competitors from mating opportunities. And it favors traits like large body size and strength and, and anatomical weapons like large canine teeth or antlers, um, dominance displays to avoid fights because, look, I'm definitely going to win, so you should just back down. Um, and then mate choice is just what it sounds like. And it favors traits that are attractive to the opposite sex, sexual displays and ornaments, that sort of thing, okay? Um, so, question, which mechanism of sexual selection is depicted here? Of contest, competition, and mate choice. Contest, thank you, good job. Okay, um, and which, and this is also why you don't put two adult male gorillas in the same enclosure in a zoo. Uh, they will hurt each other. 
Um, does it remind you of football a little bit? Maybe like a defensive, <laughs> defensive lineman getting up under, anyway. Um, they, they look like they work out. Um, and then um, this, this, is, um, a, this is a bird. That's a male right there, a superb bird of paradise. And the male takes his feathers and he sticks them out like this. And it does a little dance like that. And then the female may mate with him or she may just fly away. So what mechanism of sexual selection is that? Mate choice. Okay, good job. So I ask you not just to test whether you're paying attention, but also to make the point that we can infer ancestral selection pressures by looking at the traits those selection pressures designed. Form follows function, right? And that's going to be important because what we'll do is we'll look at human traits and say, well, you know, how do they function or what does it look like they were designed for? What kinds of selection pressures um, shaped them? Now, before we get back to people, um, I'd like, I have a little experiment for you. So if you have cell phones, this, this involves you're doing a little, a little experiment. Um, I'm going to play, this is for just the women first. We, I, I wanted to do it both sexes at the same time. Technical reasons didn't work out. So just the women, and then we'll do just the men, okay? So I'm going to play two sets of stimuli for you. And for women, they're, they're, it's a male voice, and it's just a pair. And you'll tell me which one, the first or the second, is more sexually attractive, okay? That'll do that for one st stimulus pair, and you vote. And then I'll do it for another stimulus pair, and you vote on that. Which one's more sexually attractive? So <clears throat> I'll give you a minute to get there. This is the, the website. Maybe you already voted for Barry White there. It's a good voice. He has a good voice. Okay, you ready? Okay, so here we go. Here's the first stimulus pair. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. Now, you don't have to want to have sex with this man. But, <laughs> but if, you, if you had to pick. Okay, did you do it? All right, ready for the next one? This is stimulus... B, this is guy, guy B here. Here we go. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. Okay. Okay, so, so now men, your turn. And here's what you're going to answer, if you will oblige me. Um, you're going to answer which one sounds more physically dominant like able to win a fight, okay? Can you go to the site? Everybody ready? Okay, I'm gonna play them now, this is for guys. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. That was the first one, you pick which of those Sounds more dominant, first or second? Oh, darn. Hey, the show will go on. I have a feeling our results are going to be difficult to interpret. <laughs> this isn't the, OK. Well, anyway, should we try one more anyway? So this, again, you're going to pick which of these two sounds more dominant. Guys, here we go, OK, first or second. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. Anyway, OK, so if you've done that, what I manipulated there, it was the same two guys, the one guy's voice and then another guy's voice. And each of those was just manipulated in fundamental frequency. And so really, a real quick acoustics lesson here for you that then we'll be able to, this is the boring part, then we'll be able to carry through the rest of the talk. Um, so fundamental frequency is just the rate of vocal fold vibra vibration during phonation. So when we speak, air from our lungs is forced past our vocal folds and they vibrate, right? And things that vibrate more quickly we perceive as a higher pitch. There are more cycles per second or hertz. And things that, are, that vibrate more slowly we perceive that as a, as a lower pitch. So fundamental frequency, or FO, is the acoustic parameter that's closest to what we perceive as pitch. And that's what was manipulated there. Um, and there's a sex difference in pitch, as you probably know. Um, so boys and girls, there's no sex difference. 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, there's no difference in fundamental frequency. Sometime between 11 and 19 years, male's voice pitch drops precipitously to be half the, the fundamental frequency, half the cycles per second of females, so, which corresponds to about a, a, um, an octave in pitch. 
So there's a big difference, and it happens at puberty. Why? Because males' testes start producing high levels of testosterone, and testosterone cycles through the body, through the blood, like hormones do. And everywhere in the body that, there are, that there's tissue that has androgen receptors, receptors for that hormone, the hormone binds on and it changes gene expression. So it changes the development of tissue. And our vocal folds are lousy with androgen receptors. And our vocal folds are skeletal muscle. And so testosterone does to them what it does to other muscles, which is it makes them go bigger. And that's why you know, athletes abuse anabolic steroids, because it makes muscle grow bigger. So that's what happens to men's vocal folds at puberty. And as you know from looking inside of a piano, longer, thicker things vibrate more slowly, and we perceive that as a lower pitch. Now, how big of a sex difference is this? It's really big. It's one of, that's why, you know, I've sort of chosen, I study lots of, I mean, students in my lab study lots of different um, sexually dimorphic characteristics, characteristics that show sex differences in people, psychological ones, anatomical ones. But voice pitch is a really nice example because it is so dimorphic. Um, and just to give you some examples, I mean, you know that there's a sex difference in height. Men tend to be taller, but there's substantial overlap. The sex difference in fundamental frequency is way bigger. So to give you one example, when we measured over 600 young adult men and women, there was no overlap. The average speaking fundamental frequency of the highest pitch guy's voice was lower than the average speaking fundamental frequency of the lowest pitch woman's voice. That's a big sex difference of almost six standard deviations, okay? Um, and this is not something that depends, you, you see the same sex difference regardless of population and language. So these are some data um, from um, the Chamani, our, our forager, um, horticulturalists. Um, and so anyway, you see the same thing across societies. And what a nice trait then to use as a sort of lens for studying human sexual selection. Sexually selected traits, like a peacock's tail feathers, tend to emerge, oh, Spartans? Uh, yeah, this is Michigan State. Michigan State Spartans, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, should have mentioned that. Uh, sexually selected traits tend to emerge at sexual maturity, and, um, and they sh tend to show sex differences, like a peacock's tail feathers. Peahens don't have them, peacocks have them, and they grow them um, at puberty. Okay, so here's a question. Why do we have, I mean, we are an incredibly verbal species, right? We communicate acoustically through our vocalizations like no other species, and both sexes do it. So why would there be a, such a big sex difference in a mode of communication that both sexes use so equally? Um, and so that's a really important question to try to address because it can tell us something about our evolutionary history and how selection has shaped us. Now, um, one of our approaches to studying this question has been to look at sex differences in fundamental frequency in primates generally. And so what we did is we collected the largest, to our knowledge, the largest in the world collection of, of primate vocalizations, anthropoid primates, so monkeys and apes, um, of known sex and adult status. As far as we know, the biggest collection in the world, thousands of recordings. We selected over 1,700 of them that were of sufficiently high quality. We measured fundamental frequency in all of those so we could characterize the magnitude of the sex difference in, in, in each species, okay? And so these are the species shown here for which we, we have both sexes represented well. And, um, and the green, by the way, is the range of non-human primates in the world. So you can see that our collection covers the range pretty well, too. You want to hear some? OK, so I'll just I'll play a few for you. Um, here's what, what, what animal do you think probably has low-pitch vocalizations, like a male gorilla, right? OK, so here, here's that. Yeah, that's. Intimidating. <laughs> if you heard, if you're walking through the jungle and you heard that, that would, um, that's, that's the end of me. Um, and then, okay, prepare yourself. This is not going to be pleasant. This is a so that's the low range. This is the high end of the range. This is a a cotton top tamarind. You ready? <laughs> Sounds like somebody with a balloon, right? Um, and then this one I love. This is a silvery gibbon, and it's. It's haunting. It's kind of beautiful. Anyway, so this is it's actually a female sil silvery gibbon. <laughs> Cat calling. OK, you got it. So, so that's a, a range of the variation. And we could use this you know, sort of cross-species comparison to try to figure out about the evolution of sex differences and fundamental frequency um, and anthropoid primates in general. 
And one of the um, explanations that we could rule out early on is that we have our sex difference due to something called phylogenetic inertia. That basically, we just inherited it from a common ancestor, but there hasn't been any selection in our species to have a sex difference. You know, that it just, it's kind of been moving along since an, from an ancient ancestor. But in fact, so this is using, this is, I know, a bit of a um, complicated phylogeny, although I, I hear that you've seen other ones before, and so you're, you're okay with these. But, um, but anyway, these are the, the sex differences, and this is male over female fundamental frequency. So the smaller the number, the more dimorphic, right? The, the bigger the sex difference, the smaller the number. And what you can see in the, here is, this is us homo sapiens, and what you can see when we reconstruct ancestral states, this is the common ancestor of the apes. Here's the common ancestor of the Afri African apes. That's what we are. Here's the common ancestor of the great apes. And then chimps and humans. There's a monotonic increase in sexual dimorphism. Males get lower pitch relative to females as you get closer to people until you get to humans where of all the, of, of all the apes that we measured, we are the most sexually dimorphic in fundamental frequency, even more than gorillas and, and orangutans. So phylogenetic inertia, no. It looks like there's been selection specifically in our lineage for a bigger sex difference. So why? Um, well, we tested a sexual selection hypothesis that it has to do with mating competition. And in primates, you get more intense mating competition among males in, in a polygynous mating system. So like in gorillas, one male um, can have multiple mates at the same time, but then other males have no mates at all. And so there's intense competition to be one of the males who has lots of mating opportunities versus one who has no mating opportunities and doesn't leave any offspring. Um, and then in monogamous species, sexual selection is less intense. Everybody has a mate, pretty much. Okay, um, so what we tested is when you see evolutionary transitions toward monogamy, do you see an increase in fundamental frequency dimorphism? And yes, you do. And evolutionary transitions toward monogamy, did I just say polygyny or monogamy? I said it the wrong way. Um, when you have evolutionary transitions toward polygyny, you see bigger dimorphism. When you see transitions toward monogamy, there's a decrease in, in dimorphism. So that suggests a couple of things. Number one, that sexual selection plays a role in the evolution of differences in pitch in non-human primates. And it suggests that it might have something to do with male-male competition for mates, right? Because it's males that are competing intensely for mates in a polygynous mating system versus a monogamous one. But it's still possible that maybe in humans, um, there's been selection on women to have a high pitch. You know, maybe that increases mate attraction. And for sure, women's voices are important in mate choice in people. They contain information about mate quality. And I'll just give you one piece of evidence that, I, that we've found in my lab and I just think is fascinating. We measured the same women two times in the cycle. We tried to target the late follicular phase when conception risk is highest and the mid-luteal phase when conception risk is zero. And we collected uh, voice recordings and then saliva samples to measure estradiol and progesterone, which have a very one-to-one -one relationship um, with conception risk. Basically, when estradiol is high and progesterone is low, that's the fertile part of the cycle. And the non-fertile part of the cycle, estradiol is low, progesterone is high. And what we found is that changes in the same women, this is over 200 women, in the same women, changes over the cycle in estradiol and progesterone predicted changes in voice attractiveness so that women's voices were most attractive. Here's voice attractive. Most attractive when progesterone is low and estradiol is high, corresponding with the fertile part of the cycle. That's cool. And it, and it suggests that that and other types of evidence that link women's voices to mate quality suggest that maybe men's preferences for women's voices drove fundamental frequency up. There are a couple of problems with that. Number one, you remember women's voice doesn't get higher at puberty. It's men's voice drops lower. But the more important one is that this isn't mediated by fundamental frequency. In other words, um, the change over the cycle in voice attractiveness is not because of a change over the cycle in pitch. And furthermore, um, when you look at women's voices and you see how much of the variation in voice attractiveness is explained by fundamental frequency, it's almost none when you control for other acoustic parameters. So that's probably not mainly what's going on. but there is better evidence for sexual selection in men. And these are results from a study where um, I took the same voices and I, I manipulated them to be more masculine or more feminine and played them for women. And these were all normally cycling women and I got information about where they were in the ovulatory cycle. And the prediction, and this was based on previous theory, was that a, a deep masculine voice might be an indicator of genetic quality in males. So the prediction is that women would prefer more masculine voices 
It's a fertile time in the cycle, and specifically for sex versus for a long-term relationship. That's when you could take advantage of mating with a male with good genes, is having sex, and at the fertile time of the cycle. And that's what I found, and this re result has been replicated um, by a couple of labs since then. However, <clears throat> the effect on women like a more masculine voice, but a little bit. More at the fertile time of the cycle and, and more for sex, and it's really not that big of an effect compared to the effect on the appearance of dominance to men. The effect size is 15 times as great. The same manipulation in voice pitch has a 15 times greater effect on how big and scary a guy sounds. It's like it's an exaggeration of size. You know, some species do this, piloerection, they stick up their hair. It looks like in humans that's what happened. Men evolved a deep voice to exaggerate their size. Now, let's have a look at your results from, from the, the experiment that we just did. This could be all over the place. Um, okay, well, that's exactly what I said. So I think it either worked or I just got super lucky. Um, <laughs> um, women preferred lower pitch on average, but it had a little effect. And lower pitch was way, had a way bigger effect on dominance. Hey, that's great. We're doing a bigger version of this study across as many human cultures as we can collect right now, traditional societies. and. Uh, and that sort of thing. So, so this, is, this is promising because I haven't actually started looking at the data we've collected from other societies. So, uh, so the fact that it worked in the, under these conditions, I'm, I'm, I'm opt optimistic. Um, but here's the thing. When I started studying voice, I, you know, I thought, here's a trait that's got to be sexually selected. It has all the hallmarks of a sexually selected trait. It emerges at sexual maturity, is highly dimorphic, that sort of thing. Um, and once I started studying it, I, found, I started finding these results. And that was different from the, the literature that was around in evolutionary anthropology and evolutionary psychology at the time, which is that men were like peacocks and their traits were shaped by female choice. And I, I wasn't seeing that. And when I started looking at other literature and doing, and doing research on other traits, you see the same pattern over and over, which, oops, can we go back to my slide? Yeah, thanks. Let's see, where are we? Okay, there we go. Um, you st see the same pattern over and over, which is when you manipulate putative sexually selected traits in men, whether it's a masculine body or facial masculinity, this is just the same face but manipulated to either be more feminine or more masculine, or beards versus no beards, whatever it ha or, or voice, whatever it happens to be, women might prefer a little bit more masculine than average. Generally, they prefer around the average, very curvilinear. You get very masculine, it's less attractive. Women don't prefer as muscular of a guy as guys think that they do, for example. Um, and you know, women like a little bit taller than average, but not too tall. And for face stuff, you know, some studies find that women prefer a little bit more feminine than the average face. But that is against the backdrop of a very constant effect of the more masculine, the more dominant. It really looks like, so when we go back to form follows function and how we can infer, uh, you know, ancestral selection pressures by looking at the traits that those designed, men's traits look like they were designed to function in contest competition. They're way better at that than they are at attracting females. So, <laughs> um, yeah, beer, most studies find that beards make men, you know, less attractive. So public service announcement for the, for the men out there. <laughs> Although a five o'clock shadow isn't bad, but full beard. Uh, but, but it depends on what you want, because they, they're really good at making you seem older and more dominant. Now, um, so in this regard, our apple hasn't fallen far from the phylogenetic tree. We're like our closest relatives. Males compete for mates, mainly via contest competition. But what kind of a Valentine's Day message is that? It's a little dark, isn't it? That, you know, um, you came to hear about sex and maybe love, and I tell you about how our male ancestors intimidated one another and beat each other up or something. Um, where's the love? Here it is. Um, well, okay. <laughs> maybe monkey love. Um, but more to the point, this is a way in which we're different from many other primates. So some, in some female primates, like here are our closest relatives, um, chimpanzees, females advertise where they are in the cycle through, es f through genital swellings like these, um, changes in behavior. And, and other primates may not have these really conspicuous cues to, to ovulation, cues to when they're fertile in the cycle, but nevertheless their, their, con their ovulation is still conspicuous. You could tell. Um, but we're not like that at all, right? So why do we, why is ovulation so hard to detect in people? Why is it why does it look like it's been concealed over evolutionary time? This is why. 
these are data from chimpanzees, and these are copulations with the alpha male. The alpha male, when you can tell when females are ovulating, the alpha male or dominant males monopolize those copulations. These are from 10 females across 26 cycles total. And look at this, the shaded is the fertile window. And the alpha male monopolized not just copulations in the fertile window, but he even got the day before and the day after, right? He's got it. And those other males may, may copulate with the females, but it's not during the fertile time of the cycle. Okay, that's fine if you're a female in a species where all you can really get from males is sperm. You know, that that's basically the benefit you get is, is good genes. Mate with a dominant male, you'll probably get healthier, stronger offspring. But sometime in the last few million years, as our brains got bigger and our offspring got needier, men started investing in their mates and offspring. And um, you know, for, that's especially the, true for subordinate males because for them, that's a good deal. It's better to, to, to get a mate than not have any mate at all and direct your reproductive effort toward your own offspring. But that's the problem. If ovulation were not concealed, then the dominant male would monopolize copulations and males couldn't invest in their own offspring. So concealing ovulation is a strategy for females to control mating access to themselves, and so you have all these changes. I think it's, it's reasonable to say that all of these things evolving together, concealed ovulation, male investment, females having sex throughout the cycle, not just in the fertile window, and evolving a preference for investing males, that those are very much part of, in our lineage, the evolution of romantic love. And that is a better Valentine's Day message, don't you think? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>